should do it. an excellent and biddable audience you are. Um, that's great. All right, the very first thing I have to tell you is please make your phones silent. I feel sure that if the author of the book was here, he would have provided a bucket of water for the purpose. <laughs> However, you're just going to have to find another way to do it. Great stuff. Firstly, uh, the welcome to country. We acknowledge that we are on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. This land was never ceded. Well, hello everybody. I'm Peg Putt. I'm the eldest daughter of Colin Putt, who wrote this book. Unfortunately, Colin died in 2016 rather suddenly, so we're launching it posthumously. So it was, that's why he couldn't bring the bucket of water. I'll start with the title of the book. Colin's working title was the second law. Hmm. Meaningless probably to most of the population. The full title would have been The Second Law of Thermodynamics, My Take on Life. Imagine the rush for this one. It was my brother Jared who came up with blown up blown away, blown over and blown away. It felt instantly right. There are lots of examples of each of them, but then you'll have to read the book to find out. So that was the first part of the title, blown up, blown over and blown away. The second law of thermodynamics had to go in the title somewhere. But there was also another competing contender for part of the title. A Life of Adventure and Misadventure in Exploration and Engineering. And this was a good title, but the whole thing was too long. You couldn't have this and the thermodynamics bit. Anyway, our family decided that blown up, blown over and blown away was good, and the second law of thermodynamics, my take on life, could be simplified to the second law of thermodynamics, me. The other title, a Life of Adventure, etc., wasn't abandoned. It became the title of the introduction written by Colin's wife, Jane, my mother, who's sitting here on my right and will shortly take part in this whole proceedings. So, who in this audience knows the second law of thermodynamics? Please put your hand up. 
Oh my God, I don't know if that's a representative sample. I'm sure there's too, too many. Which is probably reflects the fact that some people actually were involved with Colin in his professional life. So I first came across, since we're in a bookstore, I'll tell it like this, the second law of thermodynamics, not through my father, but through reading science fiction. When I was at university, we all had a craze on a book called um, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? by Philip K. Dick. And in that, the entropy was always increasing. And this is what the second law of thermodynamics is about. In that book, it took the form, as I recall, I haven't read it since, you know, for about 50 years, um, it took the form of tipple, which was that sort of stuff that ends up in the, in the spare drawer in the kitchen. Um, and it was breeding in corners. More than dust, all those other little bits and pieces that don't have anywhere to go. Breeding, breeding in corners and the disorder increasing. And in fact, that's what the second law of thermodynamics is about. Mum actually explains it um, well in the introduction um, for all of us ignorant of it. Thermodynamics is the study of heat and energy. The first law of thermodynamics states that an isolated, in an isolated system, energy cannot be created or destroyed. And most of us have actually learnt that at school. It can be transformed from one kind of energy to another. The total quantity of energy in the system remains the same. The second law of thermodynamics is more complex. It's a measure of disorder that cannot be reversed and leads to inefficiencies and loss. The more that energy is transformed, the more its quality is reduced. In other words, the disorder always increases. So, you know, we've got modern en engines that are inefficient with a high percentage of the energy lost as exhaust. We're moving to electric cars and I can't tell you about that. Um, but in Colin's take on life, getting blown up, blown over and blown away would have been a classic example of an increase in disorder. There are four laws of thermodynamics. We're quite pleased that he only chose one of them. <laughs> right, next thing. Dad's life, as you'll see in this book, involved exploring, expeditioning and bushwalking, development of search and rescue, but also important work in mechanical and chemical engineering in his professional life. Interestingly, all these involved pioneering, imaginative thought and risk management. All involved working with people doing things. And he was able to inspire confidence in those people he was managing. So these are the qualities of the man who wrote the book. He had four children and all of us will have had our own experiences one-on-one -on -one with him as he also taught us so much about life, getting out into the natural world, academically, and so on, how to survive and make your way. I'll just give you one example from my own personal experience. When I was about 11 or 12 years old, Dad said, it's time to begin learning about mountaineering skills and developing survival skills too. Well, we were in Australia, so, you know, he's a New Zealand out, uh, um, mountaineer uh, thinking, yeah, we'll start teaching the children this. So we went to the Snowy Mountains and he picked a particularly bad weekend where it was blizzarding and we went up to where it was, the weather was really foul and he said, right, we've got to pitch camp. You're going to learn how to do this in the worst of conditions. And so um, we pitched the tent we got inside, we had the primus going by the door of the tent to boil a billy of tea and I was sort of tucked up in my sleeping bag and he said, I've just got to go out, out outside for a minute. So off he went and when he came back, he had this strange swarthy looking gentleman with him somewhere out of the blizzard and in his, he sort of was escorted this man in and he also had a dead rabbit. So somehow he'd come across a rabbit and killed it. Don't ask me how. I've heard stories about getting rabbits with ice axes, but I didn't think it was true. Um, and this bloke, who he'd found wandering around 
you know, on the, on the verge of hypothermia. And so he said, I found someone who needs a bit of help. Let's, you know, come in, let's sit down, let's get him warm. We put him between us in the, you know, in our sleeping bags. And, and Dad said, and I think I better cook some warming, some warming food. And he turned to this man who um, was clearly Middle Eastern and had broken English. And he said to him, I, I'm go I've got this rabbit and I'm going to cook it into a stew. But first I need to ask you whether your religion will allow you to eat the rabbit. And this man looked up and he said, oh yes, that would be very nice. He said, I'm a Zoroastrian. I'm even allowed to eat human flesh. <laughs> well, that's the sort of thing that happened when Dad was around. <laughs> next, next we'll be hearing from my mother. Uh, Colin's wife Jane. But first, I want to acknowledge her fundamental role enabling Colin to go expeditioning and have such great adventures. She kept the home fires burning, looking after us children and everything on the domestic front. Other mothers at school told her she was crazy and shouldn't have let him go, but she believed that it wasn't right to quash his enthusiasm, but rather he should enable those enthusiasms. She also took us children on our own terrific adventures, one of which included trekking with the three youngest across the main island of Fiji in 1971. Now, to speak briefly and officially launch the book, I introduce Jane Putt. <laughs> Thank you, Peg. Colin had a wonderful life. As he got, we got older, many people urged him to write things down. All the tales of adventure and misadventure, of blowing things up, of things that he fixed and of problems that he solved. The expeditions to wild places and to events along the way. Thank goodness he st started on his autobiography and also recorded his memoirs for the National Library of Australia. He died before he could finish the book, but fortunately our niece, Neil Jill Kenny, and many others have completed it. My thanks to them. Life with Colin was never dull or conventional. His expedition, thing, his exploring of adventure, and the world was at his core. I am so pleased that his record of his life is now published, and I feel sure he would be grateful and proud that this has happened. I declare Colin's autobiography launched. Thank you. Thank you, Mum. Right, so we've got a pretty packed program. We're going to hear from uh, next from Jill Kenny, uh, our cousin, and I'll introduce her in a minute, who edited the book. Uh, then from Ian Dillon, um, uh, speaking on behalf of friends and fellow expeditioners. And then we're going to have the treat of seeing uh, a film uh, that's been put together by Michael Dillon um, uh, of the Patanella Expedition. So... We need to keep moving right along. Jill Kenny, who, who thankfully did all the work on finishing the partially completed book, was born in Auckland, New Zealand and spent most of her life there. She's uh, got a PhD in geology from the University of Auckland, has worked as a geology researcher for many institutions, including the Auckland Museum, Royal New Zealand Navy, University of Auckland and the New Zealand Geopreservation Inventory. For the inventory, she's spent many years helping to preserve thousands of important geological sites throughout New Zealand. 
1991, Jill started volunteering as an ambulance officer with the Order of St John. In 96, she became a, became a full-time AMBO and then progressed to paramedic. In 2007, the ambulance life and lifting of heavy patients got too much. And you'll see that Jill's not tall like me. So it was. And she returned to geology. Her latest research has been for the Devora project, which is trying to understand Auckland's volcanoes. Uh, her part in this is using borehole data to study the regional faults under Auckland that are hidden by the extensive lava flows. All this time, Jill's also been involved with music, playing uh, the piano, the violin, the trumpet and flute, but most unusually, the bagpipes. She's been pipe sergeant for two pipe bands, has played in competitions held at most rugby and cricket grounds throughout New Zealand and has also played pipes in Sydney, Newcastle, Melbourne, Geelong, Fiji, Singapore, Japan, Canada and Scotland. And Scotland, right? Yay. Uh, 2014, Jill and her paramedic husband Egon escaped the rat race of Auckland and moved north to Kerry Kerry in the beautiful Bay of Islands. She took up AMBO work again as a volunteer. Although now ostensibly retired, she's busier than ever. Uh, she's still dealing with Auckland faults, the geopreservation work and compiling and editing a geology magazine. See, we knew she knew how to do stuff with books. She keeps fit with daily table tennis in the garage, uh, weekly Pilates, occasionally hiking, kayaking and cycling and constant lawn mowing and weeding of their rather large subtropical paradise in Kerry Kerry. So please welcome Jill Kenny. Thanks, Peg. Kia ora, everyone. Greetings and welcome. Tēnā koutou katoa. Nā mai, haere mai. Seems only a short time ago that we nipped across here for Colin's funeral. We were away from New Zealand for 23 hours. This time we're here for longer. We arrived yesterday and we're leaving tomorrow. Back to the relative COVID safety of Kerikeri in the far north of New Zealand. Is there anything there? I've been tasked to um, talk about the editing of the book, but first I'll talk a little bit about Colin's early life. Colin Kelston Putt was born in September 1926 to Dorothy and Charles Putt in Kelston, which was then a remote western suburb of Auckland, New Zealand. That's why they named him Kelston, because he was living in Kelston at the time. In 1930, the family moved right across the city to St Helier's, which was then a remote eastern suburb of Auckland. He developed his strong shoulders from dragging boats up that long hill from St Helier's Beach. Colin met Jane in Christchurch in a foot massaging session to relieve her cramps. This was during a Canterbury University tramping club outing to Banks Peninsula near Christchurch. He got up to some mischief in university there was the game of passing steam through the handlebars of parked push bikes so that they were untouchably hot when their owners came to ride them away. And the organising of the inaugural bike race up the Avon River that flows through Christchurch. Colin took Jane sailing. They landed on Browns Island, a volcano in Auckland Harbour. He proposed to her and she accepted. He said this was a genuine high point in his life. Colin and Jane got married in Jane's hometown of Gisborne, on the east coast of the North Island. Then they moved to Sydney and had four children and then heaps of grandchildren and great-grandchildren. My mother, Colin's sister, was three years younger, the same age as Jane. Going to cold places must have been in their genes. Like Colin, Mum was al also went to Antarctica. This is a photo on the far right of her during a trip to Antarctic Peninsula when she was in her late 70s. She died two years after Colin. She was 88. That was four years ago this month. She was very proud of her big brother. Like Mum, I'm proud of my uncle as well. 
I could have sat and listened to him for hours if I'd had the chance, but you can't do that from the other side of the ditch. But then he died, March 2016. A Maori phrase that was used in one of his obituaries, a giant totara tree has fallen in the forest. In 2017, Mum, the family sent Mum pages and pages of oral transcripts that had been made from an interview in 20, 2011 between Colin and Rob Lynn, an oral history and folklore historian from the National Library of Australia. Apparently, Colin was at last writing his autobiography, largely based on those transcripts. Mum read them and even made a couple of corrections. In subsequent emails to Mum from Colin's uh, daughter, Sarah, it became clear that the family had a problem. The autobiography was not quite finished and needed final editing and collating. They were all too busy to commit to it and it was therefore in danger of languishing in some basement box. All Colin's work, his way with words, his anecdotes, his colourful descriptions and ex of expeditions would be wasted. I had just finished a large project in Auckland, and now it was finished, I had some spare time, so I made a decision that would change my life. I discussed the situation with Mum, and then I emailed Cousin Sarah, offering to edit this thing and get it published. I had done it all before. I had recently edited, designed, and laid out an e-book of my late geology supervisor's transcripts. I had also edited and set out two huge geology books for my boss, and had written a couple more with him. I thought collating and finishing Colin's book would take only a year. Then I could resume my geology research. Turned out he'd only written up to 1970, chapter 10, and no photos, no diagrams or maps had been sorted. Once I got my head around the task, dealing with this manuscript up to 1970 was relatively easy. After that, I had to rely on those wonderful transcripts which took us up until 2011, and then all, all I had was newspaper articles, speech and notes and family reminiscences. I haven't changed Pato's style of writing. I found the editing process really emotional. I could hear his voice as I read through the descriptions of events and people and quotes from all manner of sources, ancient and modern. The whole thing took more than twice as long to edit and publish as I had anticipated. And Murphy, as in Murphy's Law or Sod's Law, was watching every step of the way. Computer problems, sourcing material, correspondence with the family took ages. Peg was often incommunicado in deepest, darkest Eastern Europe, or in the same predicament in the Tasmanian bush. <laughs> Harry was unavailable. Sarah and her husband were moving to a new house, and all their stuff was packed away, including the photos that we needed to use for the book. Of course, they were in the furthest, most inaccessible boxes. And Jared, well... Apart from building another home on Danger Island, Jared had to deal with what became known as the Disaster House. This was Colin and Jane's former home on Danger Island, still used by the family. On a dark and stormy night, it was cleaved in two by a falling gum tree, missing a sleeping family member by millimetres. How nobody was killed, I do not know. They had to crawl out and be rescued. During the clean-up, they found a branch of the gum tree had pierced right through to the basement and landed beside a box that had belonged to Colin, labelled explosives. <laughs> it was empty. <laughs> Graham Budd tried to help me, but he was also busy. He finally traced Ian Dillon to Canberra, in Canberra. Fitz, as people know him, had worked with Pato for many years. Thank goodness he was able to roll up his sleeves and muck in. He and his wife, Judy, have been incredibly helpful, and that help has lasted right through to organising this book launch. And then Murphy struck again, and along came COVID. <laughs> <laughs> New Zealanders were all locked down for weeks, which gave me heaps of time to continue tweaking the book and driving the thing to a conclusion. I found a printing company who were easily able to accommodate this book, even during COVID lockdowns. I asked for three mock-ups of the book and they were couriered up to Kirikiri within only a few days. They look great, how exciting. I posted two of the mock-ups to the family and to Ian Dillon in Australia and after many months, a few hiccups and quite a few changes later, we were ready to print. That was September 2020. 
Because of COVID, a book launch in Sydney was not possible, but we did manage to sneak in a book launch in Christchurch in November 2020. We nearly had a book launch in Sydney last June, but a COVID resurgence got in the way. Another attempt in September 2021 didn't happen either, and nothing was possible until now. Okay, I need to thank a lot of people. I'd like to thank Michael Keats, who encouraged Colin to keep writing his memoirs and did the initial editing of the first 10 chapters, and also Rob Lynn, the oral historian from the National Library of Australia, who recorded Colin's memoirs in 2011. Without those memoirs of Pato's adventures post-1970, the second half of the book could not have been completed. Thank you to all the photo contributors, to Ian Dillon, Michael Dillon, Graham Budd, Colin Monteith, Bob Comley, Jonathan Chester, Peter Gill, Terry Povey, and Sandy Lee. Thank you to the proofreaders, Michael Keats, Egon Eberly, my Aunt Jane and my Puck cousins, Graham Budd, Ian Dillon, and especially his wife, Judy Dillon, who did a remarkable proofreading John, job. Thank you so much, Judy, wherever she is. <laughs> Thank you to the, bi the printers, Lagar Bookbinders, especially Sharon Simmon. They did a fantastic job with printing, and she was so easy to deal with. Thanks to Graham Budd for being the wise man in the background, someone who knew all sorts of useful things and useful people to ask. And to my Aussie cousins, who supplied me with the information I needed, including lots of old family photos. To Colin Monteith in Christchurch for his thoughts, his encouragement, and helping sell the books in his barking mad bookshop and to Bill Nye for organising the New Zealand book launch in his new bookshop, Adventure Books, in Christchurch. To Glebe Books for allowing us to use this room for the Aussie book launch, a long time coming thanks to COVID. James Ross had been dealing with us for the failed book launch attempts, and this year Lauren Hall took over. They've been very patient with us. Thank you, Lauren. And to Dale Willis from Podstream, who has worked his magic in setting up the audiovisuals here today. And now I need to make mention of two very special people without whom I couldn't have done this job. Firstly, my husband Egon, who saved me numerous times from meltdowns over bloody computers, quietly and expertly fixing things, and for dealing with all the parceling and posting of books. It's been a good team effort. Yes, yeah, so he's asleep in that photo, while Colin was undoubtedly relating some saga, but he's usually awake. <laughs> And this is the only photo I have with both of them in it, apart from our wedding photo. And the second special person, one of the most helpful things that Graham Budd did was to put me in touch with Ian Dillon in Canberra. Fitz. For many years, I remember the family talking about a colleague called Fitz Ganderpipe. I didn't know it was a nickname. Before today, I had only met Fitz once at Graham Budd's place in Sydney in 2019 when we had come across from New Zealand for Jane's 90th birthday. But through hundreds of emails dealing with the book, Fitz has become a good friend. He has a deep loyalty to Pato, and that loyalty has really shown over the last few years with his help in sorting out the book. For setting up this book launch and for attempting to set up previous Pato book launches that took up his time but didn't actually eventuate. Well, I hope COVID and Murphy's Law don't get in the way and we can get back home. COVID has put off this book launch for so long, I'm very glad we could make it from across the Tasman and didn't have to rely on talking to you via Zoom. Too risky for my liking, with COVID lurking and now monkeypox, but I, I felt it was my duty to be here in person and finish the whole thing off for my uncle Pato. So, na mihi mai oha, kia ora. Thanks very much. Cheers. Mask juggling, I'm still getting used to it. Okay, thank you very much, Jill. Next speaker, Ian Dillon, otherwise known as Fitzganderpipe. Ian Dillon is going to speak for old friends and fellow expeditioners. Ian knew Dad initially through search and rescue activities in the 1960s. Later they climbed together in New Zealand 
and in 1970 he joined Dad and Bill Tillman on an expedition to Greenland on Tillman's pilot cutter, Seabreeze. He encountered incontrovertible evidence of dramatic climate change on the expedition and subsequently on an Anari expedition to Heard Island. He and his wife Judy, as you've heard, assisted Jill in the development of Colin's manuscript. Welcome, Fitz. Good afternoon, everyone, and especially good afternoon to Jane and to Dr. Graham Budd, Colin's old and dear friend and fellow expeditioner. There were many Colin Putts, and each of us at this book launch will remember different Colin Putts. We honour all of them today. He was a loving and nurturing husband and father, a distinguished engineer with ICI, a stimulating and supportive colleague at Sydney University. He was an admired and highly respected companion in the mountains and on small boats in distant waters. Notwithstanding Colin's modest disclaimer in Mike Dillon's film that we'll see shortly, in all of these settings we knew him as a consummate leader. We also knew his erudition, his wisdom, we knew his equanimity, we knew his generous spirit, we knew his boundless good humour, his laugh. We knew his thought-filled silences. But there is also one Colin Putt whom we all knew, whom we remember clearly, and that was the man who, with every breath he drew, demonstrated that his core element was granite-hard integrity. I had the privilege of knowing Colin for half a century, for 51 years. I had the great good fortune to know him as an inspiring mentor, as someone who gifted me wonderful opportunities, as a fellow expeditioner, and as a loyal and generous friend. Like so many who knew him in the mountains and on small boats, I knew him as Putter. When my wife Judy and I became involved in Jill's project to complete Pato's book, I approached the draft he had left us uncertain as to what I would find. What I found from the first page was delight and surprise, for what I found was the man himself. The writing was precise and accurate, it was closely observed, it was wise. And like the man, the language was expressive of character and values and every page showed how he loved life and lived it to the full. I met Colin in early 1965, on the day that Patanella returned from Heard Island, an expedition to climb Australia's highest mountain, Big Ben, had been organised by Warwick Decock, Graham Budd and Putto. It had been a resounding success. Patanella, a tough little steel schooner, that had worked on the west coast of Tasmania as a cray boat, was chartered for the voyage. And on advice from Putto and Graham, Bill Tillman was invited to join the expedition as skipper. No better skipper for such a venture existed. Tillman was an iconic figure in mountaineering and expedition sailing circles. He had been a gallant soldier in two world wars, had pioneered lightweight expedition, mountaineering and exploration in the Himalayas, he had led the 1938 British Mount Everest expedition. After the Second World War, he had used Bristol Channel pilot cutters to sail to smaller mountains in the Arctic and sub-Antarctic. In early 1965, I was a stripling youth. I had joined a large crowd at the Cruising Yacht Club to welcome Patanella. It was a brilliant Sydney Harbour morning. There was bright sunshine in a hard blue sky. The sea sparkled with a million cut diamonds. And there was Patanella, a working boat with a travel-stained hull, sails discoloured by months of hard work in the Southern Ocean. The ragged baggy wrinkles hanging off her stays looked a little like battle standards. And there was the crew, bearded, tanned and lean, 
vaguely piratical in well-worn expedition clothing. The whole scene screamed out adventure, and only a little imagination was needed to transfer the scene unfolding in front of us to Homer's Odyssey. Here were the Greek heroes returning home from Troy. Battle done, victory secured, the long and hazardous sea voyage over, the comforts of home awaiting. In the following years, I got to know Pato well, mainly through search and rescue activities. In the 1960s, rock climbers and bushwalkers assisted the police search and rescue squad with off-road searches. Pato used his engineering skills to develop novel methods for raising stretches up cliffs and waterfalls. One memorable search and body recovery started with a drive into Megalong Valley. We had arrived at the Katoomba police station at about two in the morning and Pato had spent a few hours drafting the plan for a comprehensive search for a missing party. The local police accepted the plan but were unconvinced about amateurs taking over. We were driven into the valley by the station sergeant. Polite chat revealed that this burly sergeant's hobby was the history written by the Jewish historian of the Roman Empire, Flavius Josephus. Sensing a tactical opportunity, if not victory, Pado changed gear and then let fly. An encyclopedic knowledge of Josephus was quickly revealed. A few, in, a few singular insights of his own were thrown in. And for good measure, he quoted selections of Josephus's text that he just happened to remember. By the time we arrived in the valley, the sergeant was fully on side. We needed to cross the Cox's River, which was in high flood. The river was like some writhing mythological beast, alive and roaring along. Great pressure waves flung spray high into the air. Using a party of university bushwalkers stranded on the far side, Pato devised a method for getting across using a very long rope supplied by the police search and rescue. It was laid on the surface of the river at a steep diagonal. Four of us, four of us went across with chest harnesses. At about thigh height, the current whipped your legs away and you flew down the taut rope, bouncing over the pressure waves and then ploughing into and under them. I recall no fear as I waded into the river, just curiosity about what the experience would be like. In retrospect, I realised that my somewhat insouciant response was simply because I had faith in what Pato had devised. It was putt design, putt designs worked, period. Pato's autobiography tracks and amplifies the journeys in his life. All journeys, to some extent, are allegories. And the earlier reference to Homer's Odyssey is no accident, for there is an epic quality to Pato's life, and much of what he attempted was on a heroic scale. This is particularly so with the expeditions that punctuated his life. The first was to what was then Dutch New Guinea, where he led an attempt to climb the Carstens Pyramid. The mountain was remote, almost inaccessible, and the expedition also had to contend with unusual complications such as being attacked by local tribesmen using bows and arrows. And then there was his last project, the Mongolian wind wagon, where he sought to reconstruct a land sailing wagon that Mongols had used in the seventh century on the grasslands of the steppes. The plans had been found in a manuscript at the Needham Research Institute at Cambridge University. In between, there were expeditions to the Arctic and Antarctic in small boats, and then one in the middle. When Pato helped research and then build a replica sailing trading vessel that the Roman historian Pliny the Elder had described as trading along the African east coast. The boat was built and then sailed successfully from Bali to Madagascar. I have wonderful memories of journeys with Pato. One was to climb Mount Darjak in the Godley Valley in New Zealand with two Canberra climbers, John Cashman and John Wanless. We climbed Darjak from a palatial snow cave, but at the top we saw that the main range was already under a roiling mass of black clouds and that a great storm was blowing in from the northwest. It was clear this storm meant business. We climbed back to the snow cave, packed quickly, and in the late afternoon bolted back down the Godly Glacier, heading for the safety of a hut. 
As the light faded, we were overtaken by the storm. We were lashed by sleet and then huge wind gusts. It was the first time I saw someone picked up by the wind and thrown tumbling through the air like an autumn leaf. It was already dark when we climbed off the glacier, but to get to the hut we had to traverse below some big bluffs. Suddenly we were in a rockfall. Rocks exploded around us and the air filled with an acrid smell like cordite. We reached the hut quite late, in inky darkness, accompanied by thunderclaps that boomed and echoed around the valley, lightning flashes and torrential rain. The godly had lived up to its name. On it we had met one of the greatest gods, Poseidon. Poseidon the storm god, Poseidon the wrecker, Poseidon the thrower of thunderbolts. Yet I, a sort of wide-eyed mountaineering Bilbo Baggins, had felt safe and comfortable throughout this adventure, for I knew that I had been travelling in the company of and under the protection of another god, albeit a lesser member of the pantheon, and that god's name was Pato. When I was invited to join Pato and Tillman on a sailing climbing expedition to Greenland in 1970 on Tillman Sea Breeze, I knew that I was voyaging in the company of two quite exceptional men. I was not alone in this. Two young Englishmen joined the crew to make up its complement. Both of them had just left school. Bob Cumley was one. He spoke movingly at the Christchurch launch about his admiration for and indebtedness to Pato. Andrew Howitch, now sadly dead, joined Seabreeze as cook and did a wonderful job. He intended to study astronomy at St Andrews and had the confidence and arrogance that very bright young people often have in equal proportion. One could almost see Tillman evaluating him on these qualities alone and deciding that he'd found his cook. They also explained the passionate arguments that Andrew had with Pato on arcane matters in mathematics and physics. Not long before he died, I had a lengthy email from Andrew where he reflected on the voyage and how it had become a centrepiece in his life. He concluded, I envied you your relationship with Colin and that you called him Pato. I was simply in awe of Colin and the skipper throughout the voyage and I've remained in awe of their achievements ever since. In 1970, while closing with the Greenland coast, Seabreeze was beset in the pack ice for over a week and suffered some significant damage below the waterline. A build-up of pressure in the ice had sprung a plank off its frame. That's appropriate because we're at the sad bit. Um, a a, a build-up of pressure in the ice had sprung a plank off its frame, although we did not become aware of this or the extent of the damage until our return voyage. In the first of a series of storms in the North Atlantic, when the boat was working hard, it became clear we had a very serious leak. It took days to find. We doubled the watch and for several days we pumped around the clock. At one point I was on watch and Pato joined me in the cockpit. Andrew came up on deck. What happened next is described in a tape interview I made with Pato at Dangar Island and these are his words. Actually, I remember when the ship was making so much water with that leak in the North Atlantic and everybody was flat out pumping. It was the ice damage. I saw Andrew or Bob, one of the young members of the crew, looking rather wistfully at the ship's dinghy on deck, when the ship was possibly sinking. And I had to say, look, um, I'm afraid we're in the lifeboat already. It was Pato who found the, Luke, the leak, it was Pato who fixed the leak, by fashioning a wooden strongback that fitted snugly between the frames and which drew the sprung plank back into place. He did this, crouched in the bilge while the boat leapt about in a big seaway, and like all putt craftsmanship, the repair worked beautifully and the leak was completely stopped. It was, in Putto's words, just like a bought one. It would be presumptuous of me to comment on Colin Putt, the engineer, except as an observer of that engineer's demonstrable skill. In Greenland, this was evident in the way he identified the fuel that we acquired for Seabreeze's old and recalcitrant engine. The fuel sometimes had unfamiliar names or no name at all, or it came in odd containers. 
Pato approached the task as a sommelier might approach a flight of fine wines. He looked, he sniffed, and often tasted to establish the fuel's identity and its grade, and nothing was wasted. He often blended leftovers to extend the quantity of available fuel. Simon Winchester's recent history of modern engineering is titled Exactly. Its subtitle is How Precision Engineers Created the Modern World. The book also seeks to define the qualities of these precision engineers, and a short list provided for Frank Whittle, the engineer who developed the turbojet engine, reads, imagination, ability, enthusiasm, determination, respect for science, and practical experience. These descriptors fit Pato to a P. They were also evident in the second problem on the return voyage in 1970. The spar that helps hold the mainsail aloft, the gaff, broke during a gale, and Pato then spent a couple of days repairing the spar. He ripsawed a plank of timber we just happened to have lengthwise to produce two splints and then shaped them to fit the gaff. He then made some brackets from a galvanised bucket. He then scarfed the broken ends of the gaff so that the two broken parts joined snugly together. The splints were then fitted around the scarf and the brackets bolted into place. When the mainsail was reattached to the gaff and hauled up, it looked a bit clunky, but it worked perfectly all the way back to Lymington on the Solent. The repair was also done in big weather, with breaking seas sometimes washing onto the boat. Pato's workbench was the open deck next to the cockpit. It was another wonderful example of a precision engineer at work. And why did he have everything he needed to effect these repairs? Because of the subtitle to his autobiography. The second law of thermodynamics for Pato was a flashing amber light throughout his life. He knew that things don't always go to plan, that contingency plans are a good idea that hubris and lack of preparedness are bad ideas. He knew that the concept of entropy that underpins the second law means that things fall apart, that uncertainty, not certainty, is the certain constant. His faithful adherence to these insights helped him create a safer and more efficient workplace as an engineer, one that better protected colleagues and employees. It protected Seabreeze in 1970, it helped protect and keep safe innumerable people he engaged with over many years in many different environments. That is one mighty law. When Pato was in his 70s and 80s approaching old age, he tutored students in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at Sydney University, in the department that for many years had been led by his old Canterbury University friend, Rolf Prince. There he was Prof Putt. While preparing for the book launch, a number of Pato's engineering colleagues sent emails to me and to a friend of mine. Miles Kennedy, formerly Professor of Chemical Engineering and Vice-Chancellor of Canterbury University, knew Pato as a student. He wrote, Colin Putt. I knew him well. He and Rolf Prince were a year ahead of us. They caused us endless trouble. For example, by putting synthetic detergent in the civil engineering department's water circulation system and stomping in late to lectures, always wearing tramping boots. I remember the synthetic detergent very clearly. Butt and Prince created a tsunami of foam that flowed down the engineering school stairways. I think even they were overawed by the immensity of what they'd achieved. As for the tramping boots, I still remember the warning that threatened us if we tried to emulate Putt and Prince. Professor, Professor Ali Abbas, Professor of Chemical Engineering at Sydney University and acting head of school, wrote, I have fond memories of Colin. As an undergraduate student, Colin was my instructor in the lab. And then later as a postgraduate student, I had immense pleasure to work with and learn from Colin during my PhD studies. He shared a lot of his experience and expertise in contributing to the design of the rig that was the core of my PhD thesis. I later had the pleasure of having Colin as a colleague 
in the school, and he continued to share his passion for engineering with the students in the design class. Colin has given so much, and I am personally deeply appreciative. Alexandra Masiris, the manager of Putto's department at the university, wrote, his gentle manner was something off the radar. When he was working, students always came to my office and asked, is Colin here yet? He engaged with the students so well. At Putto's funeral, uh, I was sitting next to one of his engineering students. She simply said, we loved him. Biography and autobiography tell their tales from crowded lives, but they're also about legacy. And what is Pato's legacy? To an extent, it is his book. To an extent, it is us. For we are living parts of the memory of the many journeys that were his life. Wendell Berry is a wonderful American poet of wild places, of nature, and of human nature. Many speak of him as America's poet laureate. In a poem called Rising, there is a stanza that could have been written for Pato and for his legacy. It reads, Ended, a story is history. It is in time lost. But if a man's life continues in another man, then the flesh will rhyme in immortal song. By absence, he comes again. Pato's words now join with those of the other travellers and writers and engineers who were part of his life. People like Odysseus, like Pliny, like Josephus, like Brunel, like Bill Tillman. His words, his life, will continue to live in and inspire other men and women. His words now rhyme in immortal song. By absence, he comes again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fitz. Yeah, I remember um, a card on the fridge um, at home when I went to visit uh, uh, Dad and Mum, and it was from the students at Sydney University, and it simply said, to the coolest old dude we know. <laughs> Next up, we've got a, another fabulous treat. Michael Dillon has put together some film footage for us of the expedition on Paternella. Michael Dillon is an adventurer and wildlife cameraman and has been for 50 years. He's filmed three Everest expeditions, including the 1984 First Australian Ascent and the Australian Geographic Sea to Summit Expedition. He was filmmaker to Sir Edmund Hillary for five films over 25 years. Other films include two Everest ballooning expeditions, a Karakoram base jumping expedition, four Antarctic expeditions, two Channel, English Channel swims, expeditions in Siberia, Irin Jaya, Africa, the Andes, a journey by London taxi from Buckingham Palace to the Opera House, and parts of Tim Cope's journey from Mongolia to Hungary. In his 60s, he has climbed Europe's, Africa's and South America's highest mountains, and three quarters of the way up Everest, filming with Lincoln Hall in 2006. Since 2012, he's walked three times across the Simpson Desert, walked 330 kilometres from Inaminka to Birdsville and done three Kokoda treks. His most recent film, Hillary Ocean to Sky, has received many international awards and he's just been awarded the grand prize for lifetimes achievement by the International Alliance of Mountain Film Festivals. So we're pretty um, amazingly honoured to have him here. Uh, he's been working on uh, uh, a, a documentary film uh, with, with Colin Putt in it, Dad, um, about the 1965 expedition to Heard Island um, and the first ascent of Australia's highest peak, Big Ben. And I'll leave Mike now to um, do the rest. Thank you.
Thank you, Peg. My, my speech won't be as long as your introduction. <laughs> but, but the thing is that what, it, it's a, what I have not done is ever, ever done a trip with Colin, uh, as some people in the room have. Uh, but uh, I think I did help one day when they were preparing for this Heard Island journey they did in 1965. I went down to help one day, and I'm just as impractical as Colin's practical, so I probably put their expedition back a couple of weeks. But... Um, but no, look, the thing is, um, since then, um, I've, I've kept in touch with um, all the people on the expedition, particularly um, Graham Budd, who's, who's been to Heard Island more than anybody else, and I even got a chance to go with him too. So we, we were very clever in that 10 years ago, Graham and I sat every, Colin down and all the other people who are still on, uh, living from that expedition, and they talked about it. So what we can do is, in a sense, we can have Colin at his own book launch. We're about to see and hear him. And we, we, th you're just seeing 15 minutes of some of the things he said about that expedition. You've got a bit of a taste of his sense of humour. Uh, but we do intend to make it into a, I guess it's such a big, uh, it'll be about a 100-minute documentary, which you hope to hire a cinema or something, and we'll tell you all about it, because you'll get more of Colin then. And a great story, that this journey they did from... Uh, you know, sailing down from Sydney to to to, to climb uh, Australia's highest mountain. Uh, so here's a little taste of, or here's Colin at his own book launch. You're, thank And I was the youngest and an apprentice expeditioner, and uh, this was a mighty gift from Warwick to me. I reckon gift for a lifetime. As the years roll by, I just wonder more and more at it and Warwick's vision that he'd create this journey where we sail to an island of fire and ice. How good is that? And land on the island and then this peak that hasn't been climbed and sail home. It's just forever exciting. Yes, well... Uh... I first heard of the expedition in uh, 1963 when I was overseas on a business trip and I called in at my company's headquarters at Millbank in London and there was some mail for me and there was a letter there from Warwick which was quite brief and uh, to the point it, it said we are going to Heard Island next year uh, can you come? And my wife Jane had opened the letter and sent it on to me and she'd written in the margin, yes, you may go. <laughs> so I went. And uh, I guess this is the disappointing story of my going on expeditions. Um, everybody expects you to go because it is there or because it's a challenge or something. But I go because somebody asked me. And uh, I'm content to uh, be a supporter rather than the, the leader. I'm not very good at that. So here was an expedition I might be able to support with my knowledge of machinery and ships and uh, my limited ability as a climber. And I went along. I think I wrote the letter to Kellogg's, the cornflakes and breakfast food people, asking whether they'd like to donate 200 weight, I said, of assorted breakfast foods to the expedition. Oh yes, they said, we'll send it along. Where do you want it delivered? So I gave them the address of my garage at Hornsby, where we were stocking up with all the bits and pieces for the expedition. And a big van arrived with 200 weight of assorted breakfast foods on board. And... Um, when it was unloaded into the garage, the garage was full. It's very voluminous, this stuff. So we had to do something about this. And we opened the packets one after another and poured them in and got them stamped down. And we finished up with a, a concentrate. And it was called clogs. And it was... It only took two fertiliser bags to contain it. And there was a good 200 weight there. And it was very nourishing, um, with added milk and sugar at 
provided 22% of your daily food needs or something, and it was very popular. And when we got to sea, I had a problem which was solved by clogs. And it was a, a real relief to get over to Albany and join the ship and uh, decide that the anchor wasn't heavy enough and uh, go with Alec Thixton to the very end of the railway line from Perth to Albany, uh, the buffers at the end of the line, and um, Oxy cut off a two foot length at the very end of each rail. Uh, the train would hit the buffer before it was using that part of the rail anyway. And we welded those to the sides of the anchor shank and uh, it became a very good anchor and nobody on the railway noticed. Skuna Paranella, sail on the sea, so the sea dogs were bold and free, cream in a latitude 53. I see fiery mountain, pay for the story, oh for the song, Paranella rocks up, Paranella rolls down, mermaids and penguins bubbling around. I see fiery mountain. And when we got to sea, I had a problem which was solved by clogs. We had this bitumen cork coating on the deck, and it was on the deck, of course, in way of the big lead blocks for the headsail sheets. And these heavy blocks, shackled to bolts on her, to eye bolts on the deck would, when you're running before the wind with the headsails empty, um, they would flog the deck, bang, 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 from side to side. And they knocked the bitumen cork off in the, every part of the area they could get at. And the steel deck underneath was starting to rust. The water coming on board was getting under the bitumen cork and lifting more of it off. I had to do something about it. We had plenty of cement on board for stuffing into holes if they appeared in the ship's hull. And uh, to make concrete, all we wanted was sand and gravel. But we didn't have any sand and gravel on board. The nearest sand and gravel would be on the bottom of the sea, which at that stage must have been about a thousand fathoms down. <laughs> Not accessible. Um, so I thought, what have we got on board that's nearest to sand and gravel? And it was clogs. So I made a three to one mixture of clogs to cement and uh, mixed it up with fresh water and made a beautiful smooth paste and trailed this into the damaged areas and smoothed it over and lashed planks on top while it set good and hard to take the beating of the blocks. Now once it had set properly I took the planks away and the box, blocks proceeded to beat hell out of it but they couldn't get anywhere, they just couldn't damage this stuff. And at the end of the return voyage, uh, other parts of the deck were quite worn down and the bitumen cork was getting very thin. But these bits where the blocks were attacking it were standing up proud and beautiful, just like the way I'd laid it. And somehow, I never did get round to writing to Kellogg's and telling them. There weren't very many incidents, but one I do remember um, involved me in the middle of the night. Um, as the ship's engineer, on the way down at least, I had nights in and sleep. I wasn't on, on watches, same as the cook. A rather privileged position, which I didn't really deserve, and uh, too bad. Um, anyway, I had a bunk or half a bunk. Um, Malcolm Hay and I shared this bunk which was about eight feet long and our heads were at opposite ends of the bunk and our legs crossed over in the middle. And at the head of my bunk I drilled a little hole in the steel bulkhead 
through into the engine room. And I had a wooden plug on a lanyard that you could stuff into this hole if the ship was about to sink for the reason of there being a hole in the watertight bulkhead. <coughs> but normally I would sleep with the hole open and my ear against the hole. So that if anything changed in the engine room, I would wake up and do something about it. Well, I was sleeping peacefully like this one night when people came along and shook me by the shoulder and, get up, get up, come and see what's wrong with the steering, come and fix it, the ship won't steer. And oh dear, I thought, you know, steering gear failure is about the worst thing that can happen apart from the bottom falling out of the ship. And I rushed up on deck and with a torch and uh, there were the watch on deck <coughs> someone still standing at the steering wheel but um, they showed me that the steering would no longer turn you, you could turn the wheel a couple of spokes and it came up against some sort of rather springy resistance turn it the other way a couple of spokes and the same thing happened it just wouldn't move and the ship was trying to sail in circles the steering wheel we were using for sailing the ship was on the after deck between the uh, after the mainmast but forward of the um, the wheelhouse there was another wheel in the wheelhouse but the skipper insisted that with a sailing ship the man on the wheel has to be out there in the wind and uh, where he can really see and feel the wind and the sails and he was quite right so we had this second wheel in front of the wheelhouse out on the open deck. And this was the one which apparently had stuck. However, on going to the wheel inside the wheelhouse, it was stuck similarly. And we had a, a tiller which could be attached notionally to the rudder stock to steer the ship with a tiller if anything went wrong with the steering gearbox and people were breaking out this tiller and trying to fit it but the trouble was of course that if you tried to steer with the tiller uh, you were fighting the steering gearbox which wouldn't move unless you turned the, the wheel uh, you couldn't make it move by turning the rudder so that the steering was not the kind that throws the man at the wheel across the ship when, when a wave hits the rudder. And um, attempts to steer it with a tiller while it was still connected to the gearbox wouldn't work. So I uh, took my torch and uh, went around the whole steering system bit by bit. And finally I came to the sprocket on the back of the steering wheel on deck. And this was inside a, a metal cover to stop people sitting on the bike chain and, uh, and sprockets that uh, were operated by the wheel. And I had a look around and there was a handkerchief wound tightly around the sprocket and in and out of the chain uh, such that you couldn't move the darn thing. And I plucked away at this handkerchief for a while with pliers and things and finally got it out and lo and behold the steering worked again and I, it was Phil Temple who was on the wheel when it went wrong and the metal guard on the, the sprocket and chain wasn't very effective if you tried hard enough you could actually sit on the chain and this is what had happened to Phil the, the thing had picked his pocket while he was leaning against the steering and uh, it had taken his handkerchief and wound it round itself and <laughs> I gave him back his handkerchief but it was never the same again <laughs> We gnarly sailors lot laughing at gales singing our songs and joring our tales of pudding and dolphins, selkies and whales, I see fiery mountain. So out, free, 
penguin man stumbling ashore, gazing at the wild, gazing at the life. Big fat beauties, elephant seals, elephant seals, toddly, toddly, toddly penguins. She's all the grand parade on the shoreline, shoreline of life, life, life. Skewers a column, you wouldn't want to cross them. Nellie's good for a gorging. She's all a grand parade, all a grand parade, all a grand parade on the foreshore. Hey, you down there. Sure, life's one thing, I'm another. Way up high here, near 3,000 steep meters, I'm Volcano Big Ben, encircled by glaciers. Island of fire, ice, cliffs, gales. I remember when we, were, when we were camped at the pass, most of the five of us lying there like sardines, and uh, each one doing his own thing. Uh, and and Roddick, Roddick has rightly remarked that the main occupational hazard in climbing is bed sores because a lot of the time, especially on herd, the weather is such that you've really got to stay in the tent. So we're all lying there squeezed together and the only two books we had were by Frost and Snow, which was not by design, but uh, we had poems by, by Robert Frost and a novel about the Oxford Colleges by C.P. Snow, which certainly took us away from it all. Colin never bothered to read on expeditions. He'd just lie there in his bag with his balaclava on and the New Zealand flag draped over his bag. Uh, he was going to wave that on the top of the mountain if we got there. But in the meantime, it was a very good way of keeping bits of snow off the uh, ice that fell off the inside of the tent, just keep them off his sleeping bag. But the sight of Colin lying back there with his sort of chain mail balaclava under the flag was very like things you see in Westminster Abbey with the tombs of the fallen knights just lying there thinking his thoughts. I love the way he'd be the most active of people with all the many projects on and the beaut things created. But when we were in storm up around the pass, then he'd have his hands like this and he'd looking up and then one of the flags and perfectly positioned. And he'd just, I, I'd be wondering, just where are your thoughts now? And you could sense the gears meshing and these, these ideas flowing. And I was pretty keen on learning more about engines. And I think when we were sort of side by side, positioned side by side in, in the pyramid tent, I said, will you explain how um, a motorbike, my motorbike engine works, please, Pado? And he took me through. Um, yeah, I did a beautiful motorbike um, engine course there with Pato on herd. I think the nicest thing was that before we actually headed for the peak there was a suggestion, it might have come from Colin too, probably did, and saying that perhaps this lead was for Graham, which is quite correct. So Graham headed his way and um, Equally, never to be forgotten, just short of the summit plateau, it was a little bit of flattened out, Graham stopped and, uh, and like gentlemen, we went on together. I see fiery mountain summit. I guess we felt proud that we'd made the first ascent. Everything was good O, but there was also the paperwork to be done. And we had to... Uh, make sure we'd settled all debts, that uh, all borrowed things were returned to the owners, and that final accounts were written up. And to our great surprise, 
we found that we hadn't spent all the money that had been granted to us by the Mount Everest Foundation. So uh, we uh, duly sent the remainder of the money back to them with a, a report and a letter of thanks. And that was in 1965. Now in 1971, I found myself at the annual dinner of the Alpine Club in London with Bill Tillman and uh, Sir Percy Wynne Harris and Blakeney, the, who was the uh, executive officer of the Mount Everest Foundation. And when Blakeney found out who I was, he just about fell on my neck and wept because I represented the only expedition that had ever uh, totted up their accounts properly, made a full report back to the Mount Everest Foundation and returned that part of their funds which they hadn't spent. <laughs> Some of them hadn't even bothered to tell them they'd climbed their mountain. Come splice the main brace a time or two. Give voice in the galley with a roar and crew. Paddle, wise engineer, here's to you. Wow, wasn't that great? So you not only heard Colin there, um, John Crick was doing the balloting. Um, we heard Graham Budd and Warwick Decock. One thing uh, that you may, I know, and I don't know how many other people do know now, apart from the Putt family, but the, a photograph of all of them on the summit of Big Ben was published on the front page of the very first edition of the Australian newspaper. And when they celebrated their 50th anniversary some years ago, they reproduced that front page with that photograph on top of Big Ben with the flags. Well, now it's my duty to thank everybody. And I, I always mortified about this because I know I'm going to forget someone important. So please don't feel like I did it on purpose. Um, <laughs> I need to very much thank Jill Kenny for her editing and finalising the book. <laughs> it was a huge undertaking and she was polite about it, but dealing with the pup siblings was definitely like herding cats. Without Jill, I doubt that the book would have been published. All those others who proofread who encouraged Colin to write in the first place and led him through the discipline involved for publication, including in particular Michael Keats. To Rob Lynn for recording Colin's um, recollections for the National Library. To Ian Dillon, who's played such a fundamental role all the way through, been instrumental in organising this book launch too, twice over, as COVID blew up the first one, but it never got quite blown away because we've got it back here for you today. And of course to Mike Dillon for putting the film together. To James Ross and Lauren Hall and all at Glee Books, they've been just marvellous and very accommodating. To Dale Willis of Podstream for organising all the techie bits, for broadcasting this launch online because we're online as well as here in the uh, Glee Books uh, upstairs and again thanks for putting up with all that rescheduling. To all those others who have been part of the process along the way, in particular a mention to Graham Budd, a long time expeditioning colleague of Collins who I believe originally suggested Glee Books as the ideal launch venue and he's also been on board all the way through with organising this launch. The Putt family, Jane, myself, my brother Jared, my brother Harry, my sister Sarah, and all the Putt in-laws and outlaws, some of whom are here, um, we're very, very grateful 
to all of those that I've mentioned and all the others besides who've helped to make this book uh, finally come to fruition and have this launch. As well as, of course, remembering Colin, who has so beautifully captured uh, not only his life but the essence of himself in that book. Thanks also, uh, to, also to all of you for coming today. And um, buy up, you know, <laughs> enjoy the book. Uh, and, we, and we really hope that you do enjoy the book, that is. We've got a bit of time left in the shop so we can hang around and have a chat to each other and, and so on. But the shop shuts promptly at five and we have to be out the door before five. So please remember that. Um, we'll, we'll come and herd you out and hope that you're not like cats um, if, um, if you don't look like you're moving. But thank you very much for coming and, and the book is launched. Thank you.